hello everyone uh good evening good afternoon depending on where you are uh i am surup ijaz uh i'm very delighted to be here uh at the platform of of karitaza think fest and i have the opportunity today to speak to uh mustafa akol uh who is uh, one of the foremost uh muslim public intellectuals working on uh islam modernity uh enlightenment uh he is a senior fellow at the cato institute uh and the columnist for the new york times uh, mustafa has written uh several books and essays exploring the theme of modernity uh and the uh reformation uh or enlightenment i think we'll speak about that uh in islam and in that way i think is one of the most uh notable uh figures in the world at the moment of what of in search for an islamic renaissance uh so to speak uh and today i we will i mean we'll uh, our focus for our discussion or, or the peg for our discussion is his latest book uh reopening of muslim minds a return to freedom tolerance and reason uh and uh this is this is a work which has i think which is its global significance but uh and we we'll, we'll try and talk about uh the significance of it to for the muslim world and beyond uh but at some point in the conversation we'll also try for uh taking advantage of us, uh think first being a pakistani platform of of some pakistani concern so with that i i think i would uh, welcome mustafa once again and begin by uh my first question which is uh essentially to if you can tell us about uh his book a little bit his latest book which is what led him to write this and what what is the ambition of this book i don't want to you know because it's 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 a book that i suggest i i would begin by saying i recommend everybody all of our listeners should get because uh it is it is exquisitely argued uh but if we can have mustafa sort of uh, give us some kind of a capsule summary of it to begin with uh over to you mustafa uh, very uh, again welcome thank you so much uh, sir for your very kind words uh, thanks to you and uh, all our friends there who organized this event and and salam alaikum and you know greetings to everybody who might be listening to us today uh, right now or later online um my new book reopening muslim minds a return to reason freedom and tolerance is the product of maybe a few years of intense you know uh, research and and study but also more than two decades almost three decades i can say uh, of thinking about matters of the ummah uh, our islamic community global community and trying to do something about it and i it began in my college years like what what is the state of the islamic world today and i had different ambitions you know in my early 20s i was so interested in the science and religion debate and i you know moved, moved on to more social and, and religious and jurisprudential issues but i believe uh, i mean i think most muslims today would agree that the state of affairs in the islamic world today is not uh is not something that we are proud of we're not something we're not uh, happy with Uh, there was a time we always remember like a thousand years ago we muslims were the pioneers of the world in mathematics in in science uh, we were the ones who uh, invented uh, algorithm and gave it to us I mean, it, came, it comes from the name of al kharazmi we were the ones who had the best philosophers in the world uh, but that's not the case in the past uh, few centuries and and western modernity swept the world and compared to that and it came to us with terrible means sometimes like such as colonialism not sometimes but most of the times and it left us with a shock like what are we supposed to do with this and i think most muslim intellectuals and scholars are actually struggling with this in the past few centuries and there have been different answers uh, one answer was to say oh our problem is religion itself so let's wipe out religion like this kind of uh, authoritarian secularism which was very Uh, powerful in my own country turkey in the early 20s uh, in the 1920s and you know the of kemalism which uh, wanted to curb the power of uh, religion and society i don't agree with that i should tell you with that because i think secularists 
of that kind in the Islamic world have been authoritarian. They didn't understand the nature of the issue. Uh, there was a counter reaction which said, oh, the problem is modernity. The problem is secularization. The problem is we are not pious enough, so we should make the society more pious by using the means of the state, which gave us the movement called Islamism, uh, beginning with Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and also evolving in different ways, uh, the most rigid being Islamism, and sometimes even leading to some extreme terrorist reactions. And I think both these extremes are wrong. And what we need as Muslims in the modern age is to uh, respect our religious tradition, own our religious tradition, but to understand that our religious tradition includes the divine and unchanging principles of Islam, as well as its historical interpretations. There are layers and layers of interpretation. And uh, those interpretations, may be valid for their time and understandable at least, but we live in a different era. And I'll give you just one example on what I'm speaking. One burning problem I see in the Muslim world is the issue of freedom. Uh, we have very limited levels of freedom compared to other civilizations. It's the West, but even not just the West. I mean, compare us to Japan or South Korea. Uh, and by freedom, what do I mean? The freedom is the, the power of individuals to act without constraint. Of course, nobody has absolute freedom. We have no uh, freedom to go and uh, hit our neighbors or you know, destroy uh, their garden and so on and so forth. But without harming other people, do you have the freedom to be a Muslim in the way you understand it? As a Sunni Muslim or maybe a non-Sunni Muslim, do you have freedom to uh, say your, uh, speak out your mind and share your thoughts about religious issues. Sometimes maybe if you're a critical person, if you're a sec if you're an atheist, you have the freedom to speak out. Uh, a lot of Muslims will say no, because that corrupts society. Whereas I think, well, no, that doesn't corrupt society. Actually, when you coerce people, that corrupts society, because that leads to hypocrisy. And that also deprives you from being engaged in conversations and debates and discussions that can help you uh, become more sophisticated in your arguments. To me, a thousand years ago, the Islamic world was indeed the most productive and magnificent civilization on earth because it had more freedom. Uh, when Christians were burning heretics or you know, launching crusades against their uh, people that they consider as heretics, later people burning at the stake, Islamic world had philosophers who could learn from Aristotle and, and other Greek philosophers and struggle with it and to come up with different conclusions. Uh, Islam had pluralism, uh, tolerance for Jews and Christians and other traditions, including Hindus, and, uh, which was gradually, I think, unfortunately narrowed over time. So re-understanding freedom is the key issue. And uh, I believe that uh, when we bring these issues, a lot of Muslims might have the suspicion that, oh, what he's suggesting is let's, let's change a part of our religion. No, I'm, what I'm saying is that our religion already has been changed in the early centuries in the sense that certain verses of the Quran were considered abrogated. Like there are verses in the Quran like, Lekum dinikum like to me, my religion, and to you, yours. Well, that verse was considered abrogated by the verses that command uh, uh, war, Qatal, which is broadly called jihad against the, against the mushrikun, the polytheists. I'm saying this decision was not coming from the Quran itself. It was coming from Muslims who thought in an imperial context. Or certain hadiths attributed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, although they were doubtful, although they came from just one narrator, which a lot of Muslims found suspicious, were taken as definitive. And, they, and it is those, for example, hadiths, uh, illegit hadiths. Uh, that brought us things like apostasy laws or blasphemy laws, which I know are burning issues in Pakistan. Uh, whereas I think when you look into the Quran, uh, the, the full picture uh, in the Quran, you will see uh, an attitude of toleration, a demand for freedom because Muslims are persecuted in the first place in Mecca because they were not given the freedom that they deserve. And also uh, you see Muslims responding to uh, heretical words from the polytheists, insults, for example, with arguments or with just refraining from a conversation, not going and killing, attacking those people. So I believe 
we need, and one more thing, it is true that the idea of freedom developed more in the West. Uh, this doesn't mean that because simply because it developed in the West, we have to reject it. I mean, democracy developed in the West more than in the, for us in the past few centuries. Uh, does, me, does this mean democracy should be rejected? Some people think so, obviously. But uh, intellectuals, pious intellectuals, Muslim intellectuals, beginning in the late Ottoman Empire, realized that, well, there might be some ideas out there which might have developed, but their roots can be found in our own tradition. That's why when they saw democracy, they could relate with the Quranic principles of Shura, the principle of Shura, that is a consultation among the believers. So I think we are at such a critical stage that we have to rethink these issues. And I know a lot of Islamic circles who think that we need to use methods of coercion, intimidation sometimes to keep our societies pious and on the right track. Whereas I think that ambition is totally wrong and we should allow Muslims to be Muslims in the way they understand and they genuinely lead, that they genuinely believe, uh, which will actually lead to more honest piety, which will lead to a more healthy religiosity in Muslim societies and cultural and intellectual renaissance, which we had like a thousand years ago. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, one question then from uh, from what you've said and very articulately laid out is what in your view, uh, what in your argument is the reason for either, you know, one could call it a stagnation or sub, uh, I mean, maybe even regression, uh, as you're saying, for let's say not having a parallel. Is it because not having a parallel like, let's say, the Protestant Reformation? Is it not having uh, a movement uh, or a moment uh, like the 17th century uh, uh, enlightenment? And if so, because you know what, uh, what you, uh, uh, your work uh, very robustly sort of highlights is intellectual discussions like between the Mutazilites and the Shriites, uh, uh, which and that level of discourse, even disagreements, which would uh, you know uh, harsh disagreements. What has led in you? What has been the causes of of stagnation, or for the causes of starting from a point, as you say, when when uh, at some point our civilization, Muslim civilization, was yeah. was the most advanced in the world? So, what has led to this sort of an intellectual uh, uh, stagnation, for want of a better word, in your opinion or in your argument? Well, there are several layers uh, that I address in my book. One is the very simple fact that uh, at some point in Islamic history, states became more definitive in on how we understand religion. Uh, in the early era, for example, when you look at Iraq uh, in the first centuries of Islam, in the ninth or eighth century, you see different Islamic thoughts, the Mutazila, the Hanbalites, the Shia, Ismailis and, and uh, other uh, colors of Islam existing together. Their tensions, they refute books against each other, you know, they, they engage in arguments, but there is not one dominant theme of Islam. Uh, there were times that the state, first there was the Mihna, which was a very wrong uh, decision by Caliph al Mamun to impose the uh, one doctrine of the Mutazilites on the, uh, on the Humbleies, which dis disagreed, which was wrong, and I'm very critical of that. Although I sympathize with some ideas of the Muslims, but then ultimately the uh, equilibrium turned the other way around, and the Muslims, anybody who says the Quran is a created word of God, were declared as kafir infidels, and that became the imposed doctrine in, in, in Islam, uh, in Sunni, Sunni world. So the dominance of the state, because and we generally Muslims think that you know we are so lucky that Christians didn't have a state for three centuries. We had the state from the very beginning. Well, that state brought us a lot of problems as well. And I think the idea that one, uh, because when you declare a group of people as heretics and and you suppress them, it means you don't have anybody to disagree with, right? and your own ideas can become more repetitive because you don't have an intellectual challenge. I think today the same thing is happening. Today, for example, if you trend in the Muslim world to ban books by secular thinkers. Well, if you ban those books, it means you're never challenged. And you know, 
you don't you you just rely on your old ideas without uh, exchanging. And I think diversity in Islam was one problem. Second, a specific problem in Sunni jurisprudence was this matter of husn kup or good and bad that I actually uh, highlight in my book. It was about the let's say the philosophy of Sharia. Uh, when God says, you know, do not kill or do not steal. Is God giving these commandments because killing or stealing are wrong in themselves? So, and if we would even know this, even if there was a revelation, we would know this through human intuition and conscience. Or are these things bad simply because God said so? So this is this is two ways of looking into the issue of religious commandments. In every religious tradition, this was the spirit of the Christianity uh, for many centuries as well. And I, uh, the, Ashara, the Ashari philosophy, the Asharites, uh, insisted that things are good and bad only because the Sharia defines them as such. So if Sharia defines something as good, that's good and, and bad and bad. So non-Muslims couldn't therefore have any conscience to find right and wrong. And this became the dominant paradigm in Sunni jurisprudence. And I think this, how, this led to First, the rejection of a universal wisdom, because if infidels have no ethical wisdom, what, what are you, why would you be interested in their ideas? That's why, for example, early Muslims who were interested in Aristotle's virtue ethics later lost interest in that. And what can be learned today? The same idea is like uh, there's a there's an idea called human rights. It is coming from the kuffar, the infidels. So, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Because human conscience in itself cannot find any ethical purpose. Uh, this was challenged, I should say, by not just by the Mutezila, but also the Maturidi uh, tradition, which is in the mainstream Sunni fold of the Hanafi school. So I think we should revive the idea that the Sharia educates us about ethical values, which are already there, because God given has given us humanity, both reason and revelation. And reason is also a source of ethical value. And rejecting this idea, of course, has led to the decline and rejection of philosophy uh, and the delegitimization of philosophy. And today, a lot of people think that, you know, philosophy was, uh, what was philosophy? I mean, people speculating about the just uh, some unresolvable issues of metaphysics. No, philosophy also meant political science. Philosophy also meant learning from other civilizations. Philosophy also meant having an ethical discussion which is not just grounded in, in revelation. And, and revelation itself, I think, justifies that, although we, we, we deny that. So these are, and I don't think there's one person to blame. I mean, a lot of emphasis has been made by uh, Imam Ghazali, for example. I think that's too simplistic of an explanation. Uh, he he delegitimized philosophers, but on the other hand, he incorporated some ideas in Sunni Islam. So it's more complicated than that. But I think at the end of the day, it is true to say Islam lost the intellectual diversity and vibrancy, the Islamic civilization, that it had in the beginning. Uh, whereas some of the ideas that we rejected became the basis of uh, modern ideas such as human rights, equal rights, uh, freedom uh, in the modern world. And now when we face that, a lot of people are saying, this is this has nothing to do with it. But actually you can find the roots of those ideas in our own religious tradition, which is what I tried to show in my book. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, thank you for this. Uh, I think one thing that, you know, uh, one very interesting theme or larger theme in, in your work is this idea of, sort of, you know, these of classical liberal values, liberal values of liberalism, uh, not only being compatible with, with uh, Islamic thought, but being somehow it seems a part of, part of Islamic thought. Uh, and, and you make that case. Uh, on, on, and in this book, Perhaps, but also you made it in the past. One thing that, you know, I think because we're having this conversation and you're doing this important work in the time that we are doing it and the contradiction of our time, uh, or, or two parallel phenomena as one is, of course, uh, radical Islamism, or uh, we, we see more and more of that. And we now see a, a rise in Islamophobia as well. Uh, and when we people associate these labels, not necessarily, I don't know, I don't know how you feel about that, but with let's say moderate Islam or being a moderate Muslim, uh, that sometimes uh, 
it is no it's not ex entirely clear what or might not be entirely clear to people what does that mean what does it mean to be a moderate muslim what does it mean to be a moderate christian can you be a moderate socialist can you be a moderate capitalist so when you uh, when we talk about ideologies uh, or people who subscribe to ideologies and then talk about uh, let's say intensity uh, like moderate uh, what i mean what do you, firstly what do you think of that as a as as at a conceptual level uh, of somebody being a moderate muslim mm -hmm. uh, and what would that mean in practice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. Uh, first, let me begin with the important question you ask. You ask about liberalism. You know, I speak about liberalism as something uh, not bad, you know, and uh, the word has a, a negative connotation in the minds of a lot of people. Uh, I just want to remind one thing. The liberalism I'm speaking about, let's say the ideas of John Locke, he's considered as the father of liberalism. Right? Although, you know, he wasn't fully liberal compared to maybe what the, the philosophy would later evolve. John Locke wrote his book, A Letter Concerning Toleration. Why? Because he was living at a time that the Christians have been persecuting and killing each other ruthlessly for, for more than a century. After the Protestant Reformation, especially, there has been bloody religious wars in Europe, bloody persecutions, Catholics slaughtering uh, Protestants in the uh, middle of uh, France. Protestants persecuting each other, um, and an endless war, the Thirty Years' War, and Christians were in such a bad stage, a bit similar to what we have seen in Iraq and Syria, unfortunately, in the past two decades, and sometimes I see Shiite mos uh, mosques being bombed by some fanatics in the subcontinent as well, that, that kind of violence. So John Locke was a Christian himself, he was a believing Christian, but he was saying, we should stop this, right? I mean. What is the solution to stop this? Toleration. Oh, how do we do toleration? He makes a few arguments and he says, it is God who can judge which Christian sect is ultimately true. So we should leave this up to the Almighty, to God. Now, I see this idea very much in the Murjia approach in early Islam. It was the antidote to the Khawarij, the fanatics in early Islam who were killing other Muslims. So it, it was also the idea of Abu Hanifa and early Hanafis. I mean, we have the same idea in Islam, too. So John Locke was promoting this idea. He says the state should be limited and should, the state should only protect the rights of human beings, individuals, and not judge them according to their doctrine. And the state should not uphold one doctrine. This was a way out of the religious persecution Christianity had. Roger Williams in America extended these ideas, which became the founding ideas of the U.S., Constitution. These were pious Christians who were just trying to find a solution to inner violence among Christians. I, I find it as a good development in human history. And thanks to these ideas, Western liberal democracies, with certain flaws, especially in France, we can speak about that. Uh, but Western liberal democracies, let's, let's say United States, became places where people from every faith can become equal citizens and have fulfilling lives. Today, millions of Muslims live in the United States happily, thanks to liberalism. I mean, it, would it be a good place if Christians were dominated, if Christians had dominated the United States? It, it, would it be a good place if it was a pre-Lockean Christian theocracy? No, I mean, we like liberalism when we see it on the other side because it tolerates us. But sometimes our own urge to uh, impose our own values uh, blinds us to see the va value in that. Which brings me to your second point, uh, this idea of moderate Muslim. I mean, I don't use the term moderate Muslim that much. It's too vague. Um, it's, I think, used by non-Muslims looking into the Muslim world. I mean, it's understandable. They see some Muslims, many Muslims, in the majority, who are nice people, good people, living their lives, and they're not attacking anybody. They're not demonizing anybody. But then they see these angry groups who are militant and who support terrorism or at least oppression of minorities. So they make a distinction. They say these are the moderate ones and these are the not moderate ones. And uh, again, I find this too simplistic of a definition. I don't subscribe to that, but it's understandable. I think we can make the same distinction today, for example, in India, between moderate Hindus and non-moderate Hindus. I mean, there are Hindu nationalists which really persecute Muslims in India. 
attack people for eating beef, uh, demonize them as enemy within, non-nationals. The, the Hindutva nationalists in India are a major problem towards religious freedom, and I think people know that in, in, in the subcontinent very well. Uh, there are other Hindus who subscribe to the universalism and humanism of uh, Gandhi, for example, let's say. So we would not be in love with the uh, not, we would prefer modern Hindus to the militant ones. And I think the same narrative is out there in the West today uh, or other civilizations vis-a-vis -vis Islam. The thing is, the fact that we would prefer militant, non-moderate Hindus to militant ones doesn't mean the moderate ones are our spies serving our interests, that we are conspiring on the Hindu religion. No, I mean, any, any person who looks uh, to a community from the outside and is threatened by it would prefer the uh, more tolerant and, and magnanimous views within there. I think our, uh, the obsession in, in, in Muslim societies today not to be defined by the West, not to be changed, sometimes acts as a mind stopper, as a blockage to think the issues where we really need to think. We really need to think issues about minority rights or women's rights uh, in the Muslim world. Terrible things happen in Pakistan, for example, under the Islamization of laws, which were done in a very rigid way. And uh, uh, women who have been raped have been put on trial for committing adultery, for example, because of the wrong categorization of the idea of adultery and rape and, and the evidence for that. This is a problem. The fact that somebody writes about this sometimes in a uh, very alarming way in, in the West is not a reason for us to refuse to think about our own situations. And I think colonialism influenced Muslims us in two different ways. One is it really uh, brought a lot of destruction, especially uh, in the Middle East more so, I think, than elsewhere. But so Algeria has been brutalized by the French, by the French colon, col colonialists for. 130 years at least, but also it, it, it created a psychology that we will refuse to think anything in our religion and refuse to be critical because somebody else is also speaking about that issue. Whereas I think that is also taking the West as your guide. Uh, you say just no to whatever they say, which is which would be the same thing, to, uh, which is the same version of saying yes to everything that the Western powers would say. We should be more, I think, self-confident and looking look onto our own issues. Of course, I mean, uh, I think one question uh, leading from that is uh, you make uh, the point which I I completely associate with, uh, with somebody who uh, advocates for him uh, human rights, or universal human rights. Uh, the idea that it comes from the West uh, is not is not an argument in itself uh, for something to be rejected. However, when we so you uh, made this point about about colonialism, so when we talk about let's say uh, nation states and let's say uh, a reformation uh, in in Islamic thought uh, in South Asia, uh, in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, for example, then there there is a different I mean there is a Lockean idea ideal as you said or Rousseau or Kant or the, the European Enlightenment. Uh, but then the idea is that, you know, you, like you've been doing, you look inwards towards those societies. So a religious tradition and a societal tradition for looking for those ideals in themselves. I mean, in Pakistan uh, or India, you would have somebody like you know, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who has, I mean, worked on this idea. So part of, I think, the resistance to this, and you, you mentioned this, I think, for uh, identified it uh, correctly is that there are colonial ideas i mean i think i think you one thing that you said maybe about egypt i've, I've forgotten but saying that modernity when it comes with the battle of the gun uh and that's a lot of that is sometimes it's cynically deployed uh the western thing but sometimes people take it to mean that the history of uh the region the history of the tradition does not have the intellectual resources required to look into for reforming itself. And that sometimes, I mean, as I say, the people who do this cynically and uh, not in good faith, but there are people who take this as a principled position and say, you know, we, it was a Eurocentric 
uh, enlightenment. Uh, I mean, I'm just, you know, not necessarily my arguments. And the idea is that why should we not look in words? Uh, and do you, have you encountered that sort of a resistance uh, to your work? And, and how do you deal with that? Well, for, uh, to begin with, yes, there is a strong cultural resistance. I mean, uh, Hayreddin al-Tunusi was writing about this in the 19th century. He was a Ottoman uh, pasha. He was actually the uh, head of the government at some point, but he was Tunisian Ottoman uh, intellectual and statesman. And he was preaching about the importance of freedom in, in human society. And uh, he, he says in some uh, passage that Muslim, some Muslims have this idea in their minds that everything that is coming from non-Muslims should be rejected per se, right? Now, if we go further on this, I mean, we will reject what? I mean, Pakistan is a nation state. Should we reject the idea of a nation state? Uh, some people think that, you know, that. I mean, where do you stop that? And uh, do you stop technology? Do you, re I mean, will you, will you reject chemistry? Because, you know, it's, it was developed by some Western lab. Uh, will you reject sociology? I mean, where do you stop? The, the, the thing is, a lot of ideas have come to us from the West in the past few centuries because the West have become the most prolific part of the world both in terms of science and technology and in terms of political philosophy and ideas. Some good ideas, some bad ideas. I mean, the most evil ideas also developed in the West, Nazism. I mean, we have never something as evil as Nazism in this civilization, which put children in gas chambers and, and, and tried to exterminate a whole people, that is the Jewish people and also even some uh, other people uh, that, that were Nazis considered racially inferior. We have not, I mean, it's not that there is something great about the West. The West experimented with a lot of ideas, terrible ideas, good ideas, bad ideas, and it, it's productive. Uh, when we were productive, our ideas were flowing into the West. I mean, there are so many words in English with Arabic roots. Alchemy comes from uh, alchemia, and algebir, uh, algebra comes from algebir, which is our term for mathematics. Uh, check the, the people write check in a bank it comes from the Arabic word suck because it was the Muslim merchants uh, who actually developed the idea that instead of carrying cash uh, you can uh, carry a piece of paper that shows that you have the money uh, actually very interestingly there is a um, there is a priest uh, writing about Cordoba in the 9th century if I'm not wrong or maybe 10th century saying that all the Christian youth are now reading Arabic things. They left Latin. They're not, they're not interested in our own tradition because they're all, the, they're all interested in Arab ideas. So he's actually just like the conservatives today who are complaining that you know, Western ideas uh, are kind of corrupting or seducing our youth. Well, when you're a productive civilization, your products will be uh, found interesting by people. We should ask why we stopped creating values that inspire the world. Some of ideas do inspire the world, I mean, in terms of spirituality. But do we have political theories? Do we have ideas of society? Do we have ideas of justice that will inspire the world? Besides who already believe in them uh, because they are their religion. So I think we, these are the things we should ask. And in my book, one thing I try to show is that some of the good ideas that were uh, that developed in the West were already rooted in our own own tradition. Uh, that is the point in my chapter uh, about Hai Ibn Yaksan. Hai Ibn Yaksan was a novel written by Ibn Tufail, Muslim philosopher, uh, who uh, lived, who was a teacher of, or the patron who was the person who employed Ibn Rushd, the great Muslim philosopher. And uh, there, Hai Ibn Yaksan, uh, in this novel, Ibn Tufail describes the life of this lone baby coming to life on an island by all himself and begins to think about the biology of things and then the physicality of things and ponders on the universe, discovers uh, laws of nature and realizes that there must be a creator. So he becomes a wise and moral person uh, because uh, merely thanks to his own reason. So this was a 
novel, this is the first philosophical novel that the world knows, which emphasizes that wisdom of the revelation can also come from reason. So this was the Muslim effort to show that teachings of religion conform with reason. And, and reason, even without religion, can find values, ethical values, and also uh, can find, can discover the workings of the universe. Uh, this novel was written in Arabic by the Muslim philosopher Ibn Tufail, but it had the biggest impact when it was translated into Latin in the 17th century, and then and, and then English, and then, um, Dutch, and then other languages, French as well. And Actually, I show in the book that how the ideas of this book very much inspired the Quakers, a Protestant sect, reformist sect, and Quakers have been the champions of human rights uh, in, in the Muslim world. Because Hai Ibn Yaksan elucidated the idea that every human being has a conscience. Even that human being is kafir, you know, as you would see it. By the way, why do you call people kafir who are not even... Uh, uh, convinced by the truth of Islam, that's a different discussion. People who are people from all different, someone who's who's born in a very different part of the world in a different religion, that person has a value, ethical value. God has given that person conscience, and even if that person will not agree with us on issues about afterlife or prophecy, we can agree with that person on how to live morally and how to live justly and how to exist, coexist in, in a fair world. So that sort of idea, it was in our, in our tradition. So the fact that it flourished a bit more in the West didn't make us reject this. Uh, this doesn't mean any idea that is coming from the West should be welcome. And I think that's, that's a mistake a lot of people have done. That sort of obsession with imitating the West, I mean, has led to ridiculous things in our history, like the dress code revolutions you know, we had in Turkey, for example. There was a hat revolution in 1905. You should wear the bowler hat and not the Ottoman fez to be modern. So that sort of um, blind imitation, taklid, if you will, uh, of the West in, in its lifestyle and everything. I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I'm critical of that. But in terms of values that, that can be discernible by human reason and conscience, uh, I mean, which societies are less corrupt and have more social justice and fairness in the modern world today? Uh, well, I'll tell you, not the Muslim majority societies. I mean, there are indexes about corruption, there are indexes about justice, and just justice is Islam's key value. But today you will find more justice uh, probably in New Zealand uh, than in many Muslim majority countries. What does it tell us? Should we say these are all uh, non-Muslim societies and all their values should be rejected? No, I think we should be in a fair conversation with those societies to learn from, contribute to, and in other words, universally. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I think it's a, this in particular the uh, is, is an important point, I think very, very well argued uh, in, in, in your work, which is an ethical framework, which is discernible uh, through reason and in harmony with, with Islam itself. Uh, so I, I guess one question, one thing that you have mentioned in, it, in the beginning of the talk, you talks about authoritarianism, authoritarian secularism. And so, and, I mean, I'll, I'll just make this Pakistan example, which is post-2001, uh, when the war in Afghanistan uh, started and, and the United States invaded Afghanistan, uh, we had a military uh, dictatorship in Pakistan at the moment, and they came up with a, a thing called enlightened uh, moderation. Uh, and, and the idea again was, and in Pakistan's history, we've, we've talked about, sort of, uh, you know, mentioned uh, um, in Turkey experience with uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. In Pakistan, often it's dictatorial rule, which, and that's the, the heart of some sort of this contradiction in many parts of the Muslim world. So they are, it is dictatorial rule. I mean, I wouldn't call Atatürk I, I a dictatorial, but in Pakistan, dictatorial rule, which tries to bring in modernity or secularism. So it is the idea of secularism and a, a liberal democracy, as you said, uh, are often at odds. So, and that often, I mean, it's, you know, that creates a problem because if it's a functioning democracy, uh, it's a participatory, a representative democracy, and then you have a radicalized population. 
So in mm-hmm. Pakistan, in many of those things uh, which we're discussing, uh, or religious laws, if you put them to a vote, let's say, mm-hmm. people would vote for them. And that presents a challenge, of course, I mean, which is, uh, I think democracy is a, is a, is a is principal value, is a grand norm value uh, for many people. But that presents a challenge now that often the attempts to secularize, for want of a better word, or attempts to modernize, uh, attempts to uh, uh, more reform, come from a top-down model, if not from the West, then from local actors uh, who are non-representative. And what, what do you think about that sort of a paradox or, or, or challenge or tussle? Well, that is a big part of our problem. Uh, because I think, as I've said repeatedly, the Muslim world has never really experienced liberal democracy. We have rather seen uh, illiberal authoritarian interpretations of Islam challenged by illiberal authoritarian models of secularism. I mean, Ataturk was the great, the traumatic example, right? I mean, Ataturk, uh, on the one hand, you know, brought some laws that I would be happy with, like equal rights for women. Uh, on the other hand, editor crushed his enemies, I mean, political rivals, put them on show trials, jailed them. Uh, some of them were executed. Uh, he created a one-party state. Uh, and I am very critical of that Kemalist legacy in Turkey, which until 10 years ago was still not allowing women to wear the hijab and go into, into campus. Uh, but I sh- And one problem, though, is that for in the minds of many Muslims, that sound, they think this is liberalism. No, Ataturk was not a liberal. <laughs> Ataturk jailed the liberals. Because in Turkey, the liberals, the people you would call the liberals, which are which goes back to the new Ottomans who re, re, declared an Ottoman constitution of 18, 1876, they were critical of uh, authoritarianism in the name of Islam, but they were critical of secular authoritarianism as well. Because... Freedom means freedom from apostasy or blasphemy laws, but also freedom, it also means that you should be able to criticize your ruler, your president or your prime minister as well. So it's freedom of speech against the political authority as well. Few attempts have been really made to bring this more principled view of freedom uh, in Muslim world. In Turkey, my own country, I think liberalism, there are times that liberal framework was introduced into the political scene. And I think historically, its champions would be, for example, Turgut Özal uh, in, in the 80s. He introduced the idea of free freedoms, of, of thought, of religion, and uh, entrepreneurship. And under Turgut Özal, Turkish society, after a long time, for the first time, found some peace of mind. Uh, he was not an Islamist, but he was a pious Muslim, so he was critical of some of the Islamist approaches. But he was also very critical of the Kemalists and the ban on hijab and those kind of uh, approaches. Uh, it is true. The thing is, the need for change is sometimes captured by authoritarians who are saying, I am the person to bring that change. We see that in Egypt today right now, right? I mean, we, we see uh, some progressive you know, views on women or minorities or Christians, which I would welcome, or in Saudi Arabia, for sure. Uh, but then you have a ruler which wants full obedience to himself, which I don't subscribe. And we should be, that's why we need the political philosophy of, of classical liberalism in the sense that, yes, we want social liberties. We want women to be able to drive a car or not to be harassed because of what they wear, or we want equal rights for minorities. But we also want freedom to be able to criticize the man in power whether he's a king or a sultan or a prime minister or president. Uh, and yes, that's been a part of our problem. And that is because uh, modernity doesn't only include liberalism. Modernity includes fascism. Modernity includes uh, military dictatorship. So th- these are bad forms of modernity. So I'm not, a, uh, I'm not blessing hope. Nazism was modern. Communism was modern. Uh, but there is a better line within modernity which, in which I see in, 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 in liberal, liberalism and liberal societies, uh, which I think Muslims intuitively see this. I mean, that's why a lot of Muslims, when they're persecuted in their countries, they, they go to liberal societies to live there freely and peacefully. 
Yes, I mean, uh, I I think uh, one imp- I, I'll take this opportunity to segue to something that you mentioned earlier, which is now all of this, this conversation, this uh, conversation for intellectual uh, progress uh, of Islamic thought has to take place in the context of nation states and it has to take place in the context now of rising nationalism, which is not by any means a phenomenon restricted to the Islamic world. You've given the example of uh, Modi, uh, Modi's India and Hindutva. You, we have sort of, you know, we had the Trump moment, uh, the Brexit, the Victor Orbans in, in Hungary. And so now the problem I, in, in some people's view has become, it has become an identity problem as well. So, you know, being there is, you can be a cultural Muslim, so you can be a Muslim. It's, a, it's an identity marker. I mean, at, at one, one sort of small level, I'll give you an example. For the past, you know, nearly a decade, I spent my time between uh, Lahore, Pakistan and New York, United States. And in Pakistan, in a country where it's 98.6% Muslim, I, you know, it, you know, I may or may not be you know, very devout on, on the idea. I'm not devout there either or uh, very practicing. But in well, as soon as I'm in, in New York, post the 9-11 world, I make it a point to sort of, you know, mark identity, not in a religious sense, but, you know, say that this is an identity marker. So I put it at the top of the shelf in a conversation in, in New York. Uh, and that is creating this problem between, I think there's this intellectual dimension of this conversation, uh, which is the most important one which you're talking about. And then there will be, because we are living in a world of, you know, nationalism, we're living in a world of uh, I mean, hyper-national and polarization. And how do you see that playing out? Because as you said, uh, nation state is uh, is not Islamic or un-Islamic. It's, you know, it's what it is. But uh, any attempt for reform, any attempt for looking inward, any attempt for progress uh, is curtailed by, uh, by the nation state framework. How do you see that? How do you see a viable uh, sort of, you know, how do we, is it an obstacle? Is it an obstacle at all? And if so, how how we can move forward for conversations which can happen now with not only religious identities, but also uh, national identities, which are amplified? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, there are people who think the nation state is the most evil thing that has happened and, you know, we should aspire for end, the end of the nation states and so on and so forth. Well, good luck with that. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, I see the idea of nations, like what's a nation state? Pakistan is a nation state, like a state for Muslims of a certain territory. Uh, Turkey is a nation state, right? I mean, Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic entity and in the Ottoman Empire, it was, the Ottoman Empire was not a Turkish state. It was a state of a lot of peoples, right? And, and uh, Turks were maybe a key element, but not the only one. So these nation states emerge in history. The thing is, the era before the nation states, what did you have? You had empires. I mean, were empires better, more blessed, or were they divinely preordained? I don't think so. You had city states in human history. So, I mean, human history evolves in different ways, and I think nation state is a reality that has appeared. And when, when these things, it happens in one place, other people Im- imitate it. And I don't think it's uniform. I mean, most nation states, for example, France is a nation state with a language and culture and history. The same thing you cannot say for the United States. I mean, in the United States, who are the Americans? Well, people who accept the Constitution uh, and who become citizens. And, and they are hyphenated, right? I mean, you can be Jewish American, African American, Muslim American, Irish American. Um, so n- n- even the histories of the nation states and their makeup is more complicated. Now, that's something we have to live with. But I'm more interested. So therefore, I don't. I don't aspire for a state where all the nation states will be gone. That's that might be a good goal in the long future, but I don't know what it will replace it. I just want to have justice and human rights protected in every state in the world, whether it's a nation state, where it's a multi-ethnic state, and whatever. And you can have authoritarianism in all forms. Uh, you can have liberty in all different forms. I mean, uh, Sweden is maybe ethnically more coherent, but it's a liberal democracy as, as U.S., whereas um, Saudi Arabia and North Korea are very different entities, but they are very oppressive in their own way. So 
uh, regarding identity, it is true that being a Muslim is a matter of belief and a matter of identity as well. Uh, that is true. Uh, and today, even people who are not very pious Muslims, who can be even atheists, but if their name is Ahmed or Muhammad, you know, and they look in a certain way, they will be seen as Muslims in the Western society. And some of the unfair, you know, prejudices against Muslims, oh, they are dangerous people, they are potential terrorists, that kind of nonsense can influence the way that they are living. And they have a right to, uh, they have a right to own that identity, defend that identity, and so on and so forth. But I, what I would like to emphasize there is, liberalism is precisely what you need to allow a multi-identity society to, because you, you need to defend equal rights for everybody, equal rights under the law, regardless of what your identity is. Uh, second, and in Pakistan, that would be you should have equal rights under the law, whether you're Ahmadi or you're Christian or, or you are a Sunni Muslim or an, or an, uh, or an atheist person. And, uh, but I also am not willing to relegate or turn religion only a matter of identity because religion is theology, religion is belief, and it has values. And, and Islam, especially as a universalistic religion, goes beyond identities. Uh, Islam is a universalistic religion that is a call for humanity, that cares about the rest of humanity. And I think turning Islam only merely an identity comes with identity politics and, and nationalism. So you hate the other guy because he's from the different belief or even the different sect. Uh, it, it turns into a tribalism, whereas I think the theological perspective in Islam Emphasized recently, for example, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, formerly Timothy Winter in, in the UK. I mean, he emphasized that Muslims should look theologically into issues, not just a matter of identity. Uh, because if you do that, it's just us versus them. Identity has that kind of dynamic. Whereas I think both theologically, both from a perspective of theology and reason and rationality and conscience, the, the, the universalistic perspective of the Enlightenment, I think we have a common humanity to work on and to cultivate and to remind ourselves. Uh, because I think identity is inevitable, it's a part of us, but if we, if we uh, reduce everything to that, we enter into a era, new era of tribalism, which is uh, partly happening in the West too, which is concerning, uh, which is concerning as Muslims, which is concerning for the rest of the world. Um, uh, thank you. I mean. Uh, now I think we'll we'll take a few questions because we have a, a few of them already. Uh, one question which I was sort of also uh, meaning to talk about. One question that we have is what you're proposing, amongst other things, is perhaps the evolution and development of a concept like natural law within the Islamic framework. Is would I mean that's that's a question from an audience member. So is would that be a fair characterization of at least one of your ambitions and if so if so do you see, see value in that very good point yes i do indeed i mean natural law is a term used uh mostly by christians and catholics because it goes back to aristotle and aristotle philosophy was integrated into catholicism but it is found in our tradition too. And you know, the person who has spoken about this in, uh, unsurprisingly is Ibn Rushd, the great philosopher of Cordoba. And in my chapter uh, about Ibn Rushd uh, in my book, The Last Man Standing, you know, uh, he, he has a few very interesting passages that has not been noted, noticed much until recently. A few scholars really highlighted this approach, Karan Talifiero and uh, Another scholar, uh, Faryal, I, I forgot the surname, sorry, but it's in my book. And uh, Ibn Rushd says in a passage in his philosophical works, he says there are written laws of societies. And I think the Sharia and its interpretation, the fuk, which he wrote about as a, as a faqih, is these writ, a part of his written laws of humanity, right? But then he said there are unwritten laws of humanity too, Sunan Gair Maktuba. What are these, un so if unwritten laws, who, so where, where are they if they're not unwritten? He says they're in human nature. Things like filial piety, like you love your family, things like compassion, 
These are things unwritten laws of humanity. And he says these unwritten, when there's a tension between unwritten laws and written laws, the unwritten laws, the sunan gayr maktuba, that is human nature, can be used as a reinterpretation of the law. Now, this, what does this mean? Uh, imagine you have a jurisprudence, fiqh, that says blasphemers should be killed, right? That's there in the Sunni tradition. Although I'm, I'm showing that it's not coming from the Quran, like on the apostasy issue. It's coming from interpretation of certain narrations about the Prophet Muhammad, which is actually complicated. Uh, you believe that they're blasphemy laws. So people want to implement these blasphemers. Oh, this person blasphemed against Prophet Muhammad. Let's go lynch him. Let's go jail him. Let's kill him. So unfortunately, that fury is very powerful in Pakistan in, in some circles. Well, there is an unwritten law of humanity called compassion, right? I mean, are you really looking, are you really hurting innocent people and putting a whole, their life in jeopardy and destroying and persecuting them? Think of Asya Bibi. I mean, she spent eight years in solitary confinement and then she was still being afraid of being killed. I mean, from a perspective of compassion, do we find this right? And do we believe that this brings any honor to Islam? I mean, persecuting innocent people in the name of Islam. I assume it is because she probably didn't say what they claim, what she said. Even if she said, she would be wrong. <laughs> Why can't we forgive? Why can't we show compassion? There are so many verses in the Quran about unbelievers saying nasty things to Prophet Muhammad, and Prophet Muhammad responds kindly. Uh, and and if the people are very offensive, the Quran says if they have if they are mocking your religion, do not sit with them unless they engage in a different discourse. It doesn't say go and kill those people. Uh, let's not forget that I mean, some of the people who became Muslims in the life of Prophet Muhammad first and first were enemies of Islam, like Umar ibn Khattab. I mean, he was first an enemy of Islam who came to actually beat his sister who, was, who had become a Muslim. But when he heard the beauties of Islam, he became a Muslim. So. Uh, I think that sort of approach, I mean, you have something in your jurisprudence, but you should, you, should, you should look into this with the general values of Islam and humanity. Compassion is a human trait. Uh, so I think that's the kind of approach. And I think, yes, losing that led us to become blind literalists. Uh, what I was written there in some medieval jurisprudential uh, verdict, uh, has to be implemented without understanding the consequences. And and even those, actually, if you thought differently, we, we would see that as th those verdicts don't have a basis in the Quran. They're probably the products of a culture, even a maybe imperial state, which wanted to oppress its own critics. Uh, so yes, I do think that having a perspective of natural law, that God given us has given us a book, a revelation, to us, but also inherent human qualities which you find in uh, Islam, in the Maturidi Sunni theology, in Mutazila for sure, in philosophy, is what we need, I think, today to balance. Because one thing we should understand is that Islamic jurisprudence was contextual. When it's saying something, it's saying in a certain environment. And when you get out of that environment, it can become, uh, quite, it can become counterproductive. It can go against the very intentions that it had in the first place. A lot of the injunctions about women, I think, are uh, within that category. But for that, you need a philosophy of uh, universal values. That's why I think to think that these human rights ideas is an invention of the kuffar that we have to reject. We have to rather think, well, maybe they come from human nature. And we can actually find its roots in the Quran, the roots that have been abrogated by, uh, by jurisprudence of a certain era. Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, maybe I'll, I'll do a couple of questions uh, together. One is, uh, one audience member question is that, do you see a contemporary uh, example, a model, even if somewhat imperfect, of, of Muslim state or a Muslim majority state, uh, which incorporates or, uh, these values of uh, reason, tolerance, and freedom? Uh, and a second question related to it, perhaps, is, uh, not related. The second question is that the idea is that is this the choice that we have, it seems, uh, this is an audience member question, uh, that either we take the, the values of enlightenment uh, 
as 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 the guiding principles to for uh, a reform or we t- go back in history about a thousand years back in history uh, and those are the two choices i mean so this is an audience member question i'll just add on that a, a small point on, on my one is when you're talking about sort of you know the sunni schools for example then one wonders on at some point uh, very early on uh let's say we would recall the gates of ishtahad being closed the, the gates of capital are ishtahad being closed after imam ahmed in ambal has that kind of so you, you see fiqh being sort of you know this spurt of very robust you know even if we agree or disagree from munifa imam malik imam shafi uh ahmed in ambal and then so you see have imam ghazali but then you see this the closing of the capital i it's the hard as is it's called so no new school of fiqh it's come i mean i do you think that is in any way stagnated uh the evolution of thought but the first question would be uh, do you see a contemporary example and the second would be uh the ishtihad yeah, one or what's going like, forward in uh, the ideal muslim majority country today in terms of its uh record on human rights and and freedom would be bosnia and herzegovina uh it was brutally attacked by a genocidal wave in the 1990s uh, at the hands of serbian fascists so it's a country that has suffered a lot but when you look into itself today luckily you know uh, bosnia was founded and it is it's politically precarious because of the uh, the structure of the country is still divided but uh bosnian muslims are not attacking each other for blasphemy or apostasy they're pious muslims they're madrasas they're if you go to sarajevo today to bashcharshe you will see the adhan and some people will go freely to to pray others will not and some women wear the hijab some women wear a very modern dress and nobody harasses each other for that and uh, nobody attacks each other for being of shia or other some persuasion i mean there's not a big shia population there but um there could be so the idea that religion is a matter of conscience and voluntary choice but not something imposed by the state or by the community i think you can see that in bosnia turkey at certain times in its history was not bad <laughs> uh, the problem in turkey is that it was dominated by one camp in society the kemalists and then now it's the it's the other camp has is dominated in turkey at times when nobody dominated turkey and there was more pluralistic political scene turkey has been good but not today uh, unfortunately but i hope for a better future for turkey um uh, in the arab world tunisia had a good political evolution in the past 10 years although i don't know what the current process that people call coup will lead the country to i'm worried about the future of tunisia but at least we've seen that islamists can be a part of the political system without dominating it or without being oppressed as it in Egypt. So uh, if Tunisia goes out of this current crisis, uh, I still would hope that it can have a future. Indonesia in Southeast Asia is a country where uh, there's a secular democracy of some sort. And uh, I think some of the Islamic views I hear from in uh, Indonesia, like, like approaches by Nahdlatul Ulema, uh, the biggest Islamic organization in India is I think promising. uh they are speaking about reconciling islam with the values of humanity and uh they for example not latin ulama its leader uh, which i interviewed a, a few months ago yahya stakou uh it's it's, a, it's indonesia's largest islamic organization and they're saying we shouldn't call non muslims kafir <laughs> because kafir is someone who intentionally rejects the truth of islam that's not the state of uh so non muslims are living their traditions and we should respect them and that that kind of those kind of approaches and he says some of some aspects of what he says is i think interesting he says the islamic tradition developed at a time of imperial war, warfare muslims for example thought that they should conquer the world through jihad because what that's what christians were doing the byzantines were doing uh and they couldn't imagine a world where you could proclaim islam you could spread the truth of islam in a non-muslim society because nobody would allow that today we live in a dramatically free world that de- different world so as 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 muslims all you need is security and freedom and 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 protection of your rights so you already have that in the modern world so let's 
let's give up all this pre-modern jurisprudence based on the idea of warfare and, and suppression of heresy and uh, those kind of things, or apostasy, the, uh, seeing apostasy as a crime. So he is in favor of giving up all those uh, verdicts in jurisprudence, which he thinks as historical, not coming from e eternal, uh, unchanging principles of Islam. So in Indonesia, we have those things. Uh, we have those approaches, which I find promising. Uh, and in Pakistan, well, I mean, Pakistan's founding was very good, I think. Uh, Qaid Azam, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah has this famous saying where he says, you're free, you know, you're free to go to your temples, uh, whether you're a Muslim or a Hindu, you're free to worship in the way you deem fit, and that's not the business of the state. I think that was a great founding. Although I know that idea has been pushed back a little bit uh, in the 80s, uh, beginning uh, in the 70s, maybe you know better, but, 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 and I think, which has not made Pakistan a more peaceful and more prosperous society, I think. Like what we need both in Pakistan uh, and, and uh, elsewhere is the idea that people are free to live their conscience. We cannot coerce them to be pious Muslims. If they are from a sect that we consider heretical, we can think they're on the wrong path, but we should still respect them as our neighbors and human beings. We should understand that they're genuinely, sincerely following that interpretation as we are following ours. So we should uh, have more tolerance. And if they're wrong, we should leave it to God to you know, question that in the afterlife because we're not judges. It's God who's the ultimate judge. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and we could go on with questions because, uh, but I think uh, we have had such a good discussion. And I mean, because what you've said, uh, I think, particularly for the, the Pakistani members of our audience, uh, is. It, as it, I was just saying to you before we were started this, uh, that perhaps your work is more relevant to Pakistan than any other place at the moment uh, in the world. And this is much food for thought. And I would again uh, recommend that you know pe uh, people need to get this book and, and read it because it does make these uh, theological discussions uh, in, in ways uh, which are very accessible. Because, you know, uh, and that I think is great value. I think if doing that to show that there is a history of a vibrant history of intellectual discourse uh, is in itself uh, it has great value to make not uh, it's and it's not esoteric. It's it's available for anyone who can read it. And with that, I mean, uh, again, I'll express my gratitude. It uh, has been absolutely lovely talking to you. Uh, it's it's been there's one question from Ami. Can we respond that to as well? I see a few more questions. Nope. Sorry, there is a yeah, few more. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I was. Uh, there are many questions. I mean, do you want to respond to the uh, other questions? I would love to uh, have uh, to hear you. Uh, it was just I didn't want to detain you. So do you, do you want to take other questions? Yeah, if you. I mean, let's. I always want to honor the questions that came from the audience, so people wait there. And, uh, let's, yeah. Let's, so, I okay. Have, I have, yeah, I have a more time. So, sure. I mean, uh, in terms of, I mean, one question that I asked was uh, that uh, the the binary uh, between uh, sort of you know looking back. So the, the the choice that for a reformation conversation to be had is either a uh, eurocentric uh, enlightenment values uh, for us to to sort of you know uh, embrace or for us to look back a thousand years and so it's somebody from the audience the question was is is it that's the binary that uh, we are confronted with in terms of of a, a progress of, of islamic thought or is there a viable pathway forward uh, in another way. And then uh, the question that I asked then was uh, in terms of the, the value of ishtihad uh, as a the concept, as a conceptual level, uh, both at the level of what you'd call the capital I ishtihad, which is the Sunni schools, uh, which at some point in time just you know, froze at four, for example, uh, or small I ishtihad. So in terms of, I, mean, I guess, uh, to paraphrase that question, what do you see the, the modern role of uh, of ishtihad in in the progress in the reformation uh, that, that you work on uh, that we've spoken about today. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. 
I don't have the authority and even the capacity, I should say, to offer a new usul of you know, this is be, this is the way the ishtad should be done. Uh, there are people who are working on that actually, both in the Sunni and Shia tradition, and I I, I honor their work and they're saying interesting things. But I point to some problems in in the way traditional ijtihad was uh, built, and I also show the dissenting voices in the tradition that can give us a perspective today. Well, one obvious problem in in, in classical jurisprudence was the idea of the abrogation of certain verses of the Quran, the earlier verses of the Quran by the later verses. I think that led to the uh, that led to the rejection of or the abandonment of many verses, especially in the Meccan period, where Islam demanded freedom and, and, and also responded to criticism through civil means. Uh, to you, your religion, to me, mine. The prophet is not a compeller over people. Truth is from your Lord. Whoever believes it, believes it. Whoever wish, wishes to believe it, believe it. Whoever wishes to reject it, reject it. So there are a lot of verses uh, in, in the Meccan period, but also in the early Medinan period that are actually emphasizing that religion is not something that can be coerced and it's a matter of free choice. Uh, many of these verses were rendered ineffective by one verse or a few in the Tawbah, uh, in the Surah Tawbah, um, Surah Tawbah, the ninth Surah or chapter of the Quran, uh, verse 5 or 25, fight the unbelievers until they are subdued, for example. This was a verse in my understanding, that referred to a specific war context, but that war context verse was taken to override peaceful verses. And this was a decision in the made under imperial conditions. So I think that the abrogated Quran, I think, should be highlighted because I think it refers to the universal state of humanity, whereas the, uh, the wars of Prophet Muhammad, battles of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, were contextual. If he had to do those things because he was not given the freedom he asked in the first place. Uh, second, the authority of hadiths should be uh, revisited, I think. Uh, it was a big issue in early Islam between the scholars of Iraq and, and then the Hijaz, whether hadiths with just one narrator are really authoritative enough to overwrite a universal, a general principle of the Quran. Uh, ultimately, the beginning with Imam Shafi and the dominance of Ahlal Hadith, the people of Hadith, Hadith became very definitive in Islamic jurisprudence. And I agree with Fazul Rahman, for example, the great scholar from uh, Pakistan who had to you know, work in the US after some point, that uh, we, we respect the Sunnah, Sunnah is very definitive in Islam, but we should be a bit more cautious about Hadith literature, uh, especially if they have tension with the Quran and, and with, with reason. Uh, the conscience as well. Second, I do believe that approaches in classical Islam about human good, maslaha, or, or the jurisprudence, uh, jurisprudential preference for that, which is istihsan, should have a higher role in jurisprudence. Uh, and this, this was already uh, argued by scholars like Atufi, for example, who said maslaha, that is human good, because why God legislates things, ultimately for the benefit of human beings. And the benefit changes over time. So I think that should be given a higher status in Islamic law, as a few scholars originally said. And finally, the issue of makasit is very important. I mean, God has laws, the Sharia, but what is the intention behind the Sharia? Uh, since the 80s, the whole literature on makasit, uh, the intentions of Sharia have become very much uh, lively. There is more interest in that. I'm happy to see that. But for the common jurisprudence that people follow, it still doesn't have an influence. So how to exactly do that is something that goes beyond me. You need really a big mushtahid for that. But I can tell you that you need to empower the authority of human reason, which already was there in the tradition as maslaha or maqasid or istisan, to, to interpret the Quran. And we should also see that our jurisprudence took place in a format where you had imperial Muslim powers trying to expand their law. So they needed the offensive jihad doctrine. 
They needed a doctrine that apostasy is a crime because otherwise you have to keep people in check. They needed a doctrine that if people do not come to prayer, they should be forced to come because the mosque was a place for also the propaganda of the ruling dynasty. So the idea of coercion was inevitable in that time and milieu, but it's not a part of our, our uh, the eternal principles of our religion. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess now we'll, we'll take the last question. Uh, and th th I think it's, a, it's an important one. And that essentially is that voices such as yourself uh, who argue for uh, an evolution in, in Islamic thought, uh, and you give the example of Fazlur Rahman Malik, uh, voices such as him, such as yourself, uh, uh, such as Javed Ramdi in Pakistan. The, we've seen a trend, and we've seen to essentially shrink that space for them. And I mean, shrink that space for them in those contexts. For you, I mean, so you can say you have to move to the US, for example. I mean, to to uh, to make these arguments. Fazlur Rahman had to go to the University of Chicago to make these arguments. And how do we tackle that where this discussion, which is because like you are arguing or uh, like Fazlur Rahman Malik argued, was within the framework of Islam. So this is, all of this is uh, taking this, the normative framework of Islam and arguing it. Uh, but that space has, has shrunk and that is not, I mean, uh, it made the made us worse off. How do you think that, I mean, how do we do, firstly, do you see hope for a more vibrant, robust discussion mm -hmm. uh, or conversation or dialogue uh, within uh, countries like Pakistan or Turkey uh, or, or on these ideas? And what's what? What do you think and what what should be done to, to foster and enable this? Because I, I really do think that this is a key point, which is that voices from within the Islam framework who are articulate, who are well known, who are well versed with the history of Islam and theology. If we push them away to, to fringes uh, within that, within not globally, but within those societies, that uh, closes the door for uh, Mm -hmm. for progress how do how do we tackle that what are your thoughts on that well i think first we should make it clear that to suppress an idea because you find it heretical only proves your intellectual weakness <laughs> because if an idea is wrong and if it is terribly heretical and if it is uh, misguided show that it is right uh, write an article and give a sermon, whatever you want, but show that it is not accurate. Instead, if you are silencing that person through intimidation, through threats, through killing, through jailing, that only shows you are well. You you have the power to do that. You have the state, or you have brute power. Maybe you have a crowd behind you, but it shows you are an incompetent person. You cannot reason your way out, and that should in itself look. That, that should in itself look something not desirable, right? And people should not be proud. Oh my God, we suppressed the heritage. Good for you. I mean, why couldn't you refute that? So there's, there, we should establish the idea that there's no honor in that. That's why free speech is very important. I mean, free speech uh, says that there can be bad ideas out there, but those ideas should be uh, defeated with ideas. And I think the power of the early Islamic civilization was that there were many ideas and Muslims were able to discuss these things. Uh, you had philosophers which maybe went too far on some metaphysical issues, but then you had others who were criticizing them. And the moment this became delegitimized and these are kafir and they should be silenced and they should be killed and some people were killed in you. Uh, th that had become the stagnated society because the person who silences a heretic also closes his own mind because he doesn't, train, right? He doesn't train his thought. I mean, because even a person, there will be people that I don't agree with, uh, but I will still look at it and maybe 10% of their ideas might be good for me. So you are actually silencing not just them, but also you're closing all my, I mean, we should, first of all, make this uh, very clear. Secondly, 
yes, those people are there. I mean, they would want to silence every uh, different idea, uh, inconvenient idea, religious or political, you know, or national. Um, but you know, in this modern day and age with the internet, they they are they're on a losing <laughs> ground. I mean, they there's no. I mean. Yes, you can silence somebody. That person has to escape from your country, but there's something called the internet. There's something called social media. So you can't stop ideas anymore. Uh, that's why they should better, uh, instead of trying to silence people and threaten them, they should try to work through their own ideas. Uh, they can have legitimate positions, you know, they can defend. But I think uh, the internet, the communications of the modern world, gives us the chance to uh, open up issues and that's that's it that's an opportunity uh, i believe in, in many muslim societies today uh, thank you mustafa uh and, and thank you so much uh for, for taking additional questions uh and we'll, now i think uh we will uh we'll have to say goodbye because and i again as i said i must express my gratitude uh this is an important conversation everywhere this is an important conversation uh, for all Muslims, uh, this is particularly important uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, and and I really hope that uh, your book at, and your larger work uh, would uh, would kickstart, would give the impetus for uh, what you're arguing for uh, a renaissance, a, a conversation uh, for progress from learning from our own history, learning from our own uh, uh, theology. And, and thank you so much for taking out the time. And we really hope that at some point uh, in the foreseeable future, we'll be able to welcome you in uh, to Pakistan in, in person. Thank, thank you, you so much, Saru. Thank you. And thanks to our good friend, Yaqub Khan, uh, who helped organize this event. It was my pleasure. Uh, Jive Pakistan, you know, I love Pakistan a lot. and. Uh, I wish the best uh, for this fascinating, great Muslim country. Uh, I just will say something, I mean, from my experience as a Turk, sometimes your passion to defend your country and to uh, silence people who are supposedly going against it, that might be bad for the country itself. I think we will make our countries, the majority countries of the world, from Pakistan to Turkey to Malaysia to whatever, the Arab world, um, better more magnanimous, more respectful, when we show more greatness in its name and greatness in terms of moral greatness. Uh, when, we, when we attack people and silence people and show them zeal in the name of Islam, we're not making them respect Islam. We're not bringing uh, respect. I mean, we will bring more respect to our uh, beloved prophet, peace be upon him, and our religious tradition when we show exemplary piety and morality in its name. When we show compassion in its name, when we show that we are not, uh, you know, unthinking people who just cannot respond to arguments and uh, can try to silence different ideas with power. And I think that was a strength of our tradition a thousand years ago. Uh, and it's never late to rediscover and revitalize. Of course. I mean, I re really hope uh, that we, we can return to that and. Uh, Thank you once again, uh, as I said. Uh, thank you so much for your time and, and for your insights. Thank you. Thank you for thank you. listening to us. Um, thank you. No.